glad you guys have joined us on tonight. We are just so happy that you are here. Foster care is the ability of a family to take temporary custody of a child who needs housing, food, and general care until the child's parents are able to provide for them. Taking a child in from a difficult circumstance is not always easy. In fact, it is a sacrifice that some days feels impossible. But through this, one comes face to face with the grace and promises of God. In the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 37, it says, Whoever receives such a child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. God has given us everything we need through Jesus Christ to overcome challenges in our lives. Let's show his love by helping to strengthen families and ensure every child has a forever family that they deserve. We want to welcome you again to the Wednesday night Bible classes for the Stonecrest Church of Christ. We are encouraged each Wednesday as you join in with us to uh, study with us from uh, the Word of God. For the past several weeks, 
we have been looking at the thematic theme and topic, I Never Knew You. Uh, I've couched uh, and I've identified these four words as four of the saddest words in all of the Bible. I never knew you. They're sad because they are uttered by Jesus uh, at an upcoming judgment scene. People will hear these words when it will be absolutely uh, too late to do anything about it. Well, let's put these words in some kind of context. Jesus is uh, beginning to summarize his first sermonic presentation uh, on planet Earth. He's begun this back in Matthew chapter 5 with uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, talking about the kind of attitude that needed to be in the kingdom. Uh, he moves from those attitudes to a kind of righteousness uh, that must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 5, uh, verse number 20. He has told uh, this audience that he has not come to destroy the law and the prophets, uh, but he has come to fulfill them. That's Matthew 5, 17 through 19. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, he takes that righteousness that he says in verse 20 that must exceed the righteousness of the scribes. Uh, and the Pharisees and again what he means by that is simply this because he lays out four things uh, whereas our righteousness should exceed uh, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees he says you have heard that it had been said eye for eye two for two he says you heard that it had been said that uh, uh, thou shalt not uh, commit murder, but but I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother, uh, without cause, you have committed murder already. He has said uh, that uh, uh, if he, it had been said, thou should not commit adultery, but I say unto you that if you look uh, at a woman uh, uh, with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery already. And all Jesus is saying is this that uh, the scribes and the Pharisees had lowered the standard for the kingdom. And all he has come to do is simply to put uh, the law and the prophets back in their rightful place. Uh, they had to lower the standard for the kingdom, much like uh, a child when he's learning to play basketball. The height of the goal is at 10 feet. Uh, but sometimes parents... Uh, in order to help the child to understand uh, and to enjoy basketball uh, with these adjustable goals, they were lowered to about, you know, five or six feet. So uh, the kids short in stature uh, early in age can enjoy the game of basketball while he improves his skills. Well, that's nice and, and, and that's cute. But the child is making baskets uh, at a goal that is not its regulation and proper height. Well, that's what the uh, Pharisees and the scribes had done. Uh, they had dumbed down uh, the commands of God. They had dumbed down the law uh, of God. Uh, and they decided that you were uh, an adulterer based upon an act. That you were a murderer based upon an act. Jesus said, no, adultery. And that's just two of the four. Uh, Jesus said, no, uh, you are a murderer based not upon an action, but an attitude, a disposition. Uh, you don't have to commit the act of adultery to be an adulterer. All you have to do is simply allow lust uh, inside of one's heart toward a person uh, that is not your spouse to get uh, out of control and Jesus says you committed adultery watch the term already in your heart all he's simply saying is this scribes and the Pharisees had lowered the law they had lowered the law to action Jesus said no that's not where God had the law God always had the law not at the point of action but at the point of disposition, at the point of attitude. Remember the Old Testament said, uh, as a man thinketh 
in his heart? So is he. See, Jesus says, no, sin occurs not at the point of action, but at the point of thinking and attitude. In other words, get the attitude right. In other words, control your anger and nobody dies. Controls your lust and nobody commits adultery. So this is what Jesus is doing. And then watch this. And then in chapter 6, uh, he says, okay, now that you understand uh, elevated right standing with God, now you need to practice that. It shows up when you get ready to pray. It shows up uh, when you get ready uh, to uh, you know, give offerings. Uh, it shows up uh, when you get ready to fast. Uh, he, he, he said, listen, uh, when you get ready to fast, wash your face. Uh, don't look all haggard uh, uh, as if you don't have good sense. Uh, somehow you're thinking that looking bad on the outside is going to make you more spiritual. No, no, no. Jesus said, wash your hands, wash your hair, uh, clean your face, uh, and, and, and then fast. When you get ready to give alms, Jesus said, leave your trumpet at home. Because what the uh, Pharisees and the scribes would do, uh, as they're walking down the street, somebody's asking them for an alms. They get out their trumpet and blow a, uh, a bugle call. Da -da 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 -da. And then all of a sudden, people would look around and would see him give alms up to the poor and declare, well, that's old righteous uh, Joe. Look what he's doing. Uh, and Jesus said, no, uh, listen, God knows what you're doing. And if nobody else see you doing what's right and proper publicly, uh, God sees it. Uh, and that ought to be uh, uh, rewarded enough. Now, he comes to chapter 7. As now he begins to, to summarize uh, all of this. Uh, and now he gives us a judgment scene where uh, he says, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many, he says, will say to me uh, on that day, Lord, Lord, have me not prophesied in thy name. Lord, thy name have we uh, not cast out devils. Lord, have we not done many wonderful works? Jesus says, and then I will profess unto them, listen to these words, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Listen, friends, uh, the passage is problematic. Now, let me tell you what I mean by problematic. There is a complexity in the passage. Please, uh, hear my terminology carefully. There's no contradiction there, but there is a complexity in the passage. There's a difficulty there. There's a challenge there. Jesus says that he's going to profess to some folk, I never knew you. Well, here's the complexity. Here is the problematic statement. How can an all-knowing God not know something? Did you hear what I just said? Jesus said, I'm going to say to some folk, I never knew you. Well, wait a minute. Given the nature, the characteristics, the attributes of God, how can an all-knowing God say to some people, I never knew you. Listen carefully. He's not going to say to them, I don't remember you. He's not going to say to them, well, I knew you, but I forgot you. No, the text says that at Yonder's Judgment Bar, he's going to say to some folk, I never knew you. Some people call this a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. More like a conundrum. But more specifically, it's just, uh, uh, it's just complex. So let me see if I can untangle uh, some of the complexity for you. I'm going to build a straw man, 
And then I'm going to tear the strong man down. All right? I want you to watch this. How can an all-knowing say, I don't know you? Well, uh, this is what you need to understand about the attributes of God. There are three major ones. Now, God has plenty of them. Uh, God is love. That's an attribute of God. Uh, God's holy. That's an attribute of God. Uh, God is, is just. That's an attribute of God. But the three major attributes of God are these. Number one, God is omnipresent. Now, that's a way of saying that God is present everywhere at the same time. Uh, occasionally, and it causes me to chuckle, I know the brethren are well-meaning, that's why I don't always stop them in the middle of it, but oftentimes I hear brothers right here start first saying, Lord, would you please go over to the hospital and bless us so and so? Would you go to the jailhouse and bless uh, brother so and so and also so and so? Would you go over to the hospital? Would you go to the nursing home? Or would you go to the home of, of such and such? Well, I, I know what they're intending. I know that heart uh, is well-meaning, uh, but uh, here's the concern. You can't send God where God already is. He's omnipresent. He's present everywhere at the same time. One of the things that always gave me comfort is this notion, uh, because I travel uh, early nine then. Now I know some of y'all sitting there saying, no, I'll go from it. It's more than early nine then. All right, I travel. All right. Uh, and I'm blessed now that when I travel because my wife is retired, uh, she has an opportunity to uh, uh, travel with me. And that, and that is nothing but a show enough uh, blessing. Uh, and, uh, but there were times when she was not able to travel with me. She'd have to stay at home uh, because of her job uh, and uh, because our two boys were still at home. Uh, and I would take comfort in knowing this while I'm in uh some foreign country preaching, some state in the United States preaching. Uh, God was present with me, but I was confident by the fact that God was present with her. So God is uh, present everywhere at the same time. That's why we say he's omnipresent. But then watch this. Not only is God omnipresent, God is omnipotent. Uh, that's just one of those uh, polysyllabic words and that simply means that God is all powerful. Uh, this I'm going to shout you right through here. Uh, simply to know uh, that everywhere God is present, His power is also there. God's all powerful. So much so that it takes God no more power to uh, create a universe as it does for him to create a net. Now, now wait a minute, brother. What, what did you say? I said it takes God no more effort. It takes God no more power to create a universe than it does for him to create a net. Because the way God creates is simply by what we call activation. Now, when we say voice activation, what do we mean? Well, uh, my voice is being uh, amplified right now, so uh, you are able to hear it. Uh, the camera in which you are uh, seeing this program, uh, recording this program is uh, 20, 25 feet away from me, but uh, but I have a microphone here that amplifies my voice. Well, uh, God creates simply speaking. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And the Spirit of God spake. Now, I want you to watch this. And the next verse says, and God said. And then the tail end of that verse says, and it was so. <laughs> Watch it again. And God said, let there be light. And there was 
of light. Well, uh, let there be an expanse in the heaven. An expanse in the heaven. Let there be moon and stars and so on. And there was. It appeared simply at the voice of God. So it takes God no more effort to create a, a whole universe. It takes him no more effort to create a universe than it does for him to create a gnat that barely can be seen to the act. Because the way God creates is simply by speaking. But there's a third attribute of God. We've learned that God omnipotent. Uh, David said it to, in, in, in Psalm 14, where, where can the God of, of God. Uh, and he named some places, if I go into the heavens, if I go underneath the earth, thou art there. If, even if I make my bed in hell, the psalmist says, thou art there. What? There isn't anywhere where God not isn't. He is present everywhere. Well, I know some of you are sitting there saying, oh, who would it ever be? I mean, God, 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 God won't be in hell. God can't be, there can be no hell if God is not present. He's present everywhere. So some say, if I make my bed in hell. Now, I know that's the Old Testament word uh, for Sheol, uh, called Sheol and the grave, but that's what they understood uh, it to be. Uh, my point to you is simply this. Uh, God is present everywhere at the same time, or that place could not exist. All right, now, God uh, omnipotent, God omnipresent, and then God is omniscient. That's omni, O-M-N-I, and science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. Science simply means to know. All right, based upon uh, observable, empirical data. But fundamentally, it simply means to know. When you put omni in front of it, God is all-knowing. Now, wait a minute, Brother B. Since God is all-knowing, then how can there be something that he does not know? Well, that's the point I'm trying to get to you. That's the straw man I'm trying to build here so I can just kind of cut his knees off and call it short. I need to tell you <clears throat> what it is that God knows. Not only is he all knowing, I need to show you uh, the extent, vastness, magnitude of the knowledge of God. God knows everything. I want you to watch this. Listen to me carefully. God knows everything past. Now, well, that's easy. That's, that's called history. God knows everything present. God knows everything in the future. I said, okay. That's past, that's present, that's, that's future. God knows one more thing. God knows everything potential. No, no, no wait a minute, Rabbi. What, what did you just say? I just said that God knows the past, God knows the present, God knows the future, and God knows, watch this, everything potential. Well, wait a minute, Rabbi. You, you mean to tell me God knows what could have been? <laughs> I'm telling you, the vastness, the magnitude, the expanse of the knowledge of God. Let, 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 let me slow this down so uh, you can be clear on what I'm saying. God knows. In fact, uh, 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 Matthew will tell us uh, in his gospel uh, that the uh, the hairs on your head have been counted by God. Mm. <laughs> now I know for some 
bald head brothers, that's, that's an easy count. Gotcha. Um, what I want you to understand uh, is that uh, God has numbered the hair on your head. In fact, Matthew even goes on to tell us that even a bird falls out without the knowledge of God. Did you hear that? I mean, can you imagine during the course of any day how many birds fall out of the sky? I mean, come on, man. God shows up at the funeral services in bird. Now, hear birds, you, you used to fly some bridge at a time. Whenever the falls out of the sky, you need to understand that uh, uh, in Bible times, a sparrow was considered a worthless bird. They're riding. There's not barrel. Uh, it's the least that one can offer in temple sacrifices to God. It's offering to God. And he says, what well, you consider is better. God even knows when it falls out of the sky. Now, watch this for me. God has numbers by hand on your head. Uh, God uh, knows when worthless birds fall uh, out of the sky. Uh, there isn't anything to be known that God does not know. If I was recording uh, from the confines uh, of my office uh, downstairs rather than the studio, uh, you'd see on my bookshelves uh, somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 books. Well, uh, I know what I know uh, having read those books. I, I know what I know uh, having gone to high school and college and uh, graduate school and postgraduate school and continual uh, graduate uh, education. Uh, that's why I know what I know uh, from what my mother taught me, uh, from what my wife has taught me, from what my children have taught me, uh, from what my professors have taught me, church members, you name it. I know what I know because of those educational environments. But I want you to think about this. Uh, I, I know because uh, I've been taught it. That's why I know it. Now, whether it's the Greek language, whether it's the Hebrew language, uh, I know what I know because I've sat in classrooms uh, and uh, uh, and learned those languages and those disciplines. Well, uh, I'm talking to doctors, and lawyers, and nurses, and educators, uh, and computer folk. Uh, I'm talking to plumbers, uh, uh, learning the discipline. I'm talking to them during the course of any Wednesday night or Sunday morning Bible uh, class, uh, a Wednesday night Bible class. Now you know what you know because of what you 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 learned and you've been taught. Well, uh, this is this is what you get said by God. Uh, God's knowledge is not learned knowledge. God's knowledge is what we call uh, intuitive knowledge, meaning he, he knows just because he knows. Well, I don't let that make any sense. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, if you're married, uh, your wife knows certain things. Uh, your mother knows certain things. 
Has it not dawned on you that when the kids were uh, growing up, they could hear a baby cry in the middle of the night and you and your wife are in the same bed and only she heard the baby cry? Uh, they start feeling stuff uh, and uh, have no empirical, verifiable evidence of what they're feeling, but by God, they know it. Listen, uh, uh, I've seen, and in fact, uh, the history of jazz music, where uh, those old jazz musicians uh, play music, having never learned the musical scale. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, in fact, they would play music and they didn't even have a score in front of them. <laughs> they made it up as they go along, uh, as they went along, which is the genius of that kind of music. Uh, you, you've heard some about song leaders on Sunday morning, well, you know, Willie Davis and, uh, uh, you know, Bill Cook and, uh, 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 you know, these the, the other song leaders. Uh, at the uh, Stonecrest Church. Uh, these fellas sing stuff and they make stuff up uh, as they go along. And guess what? It is absolutely beautiful. It is absolutely encouraging. But a lot, in fact, this past Sunday, uh, I had Willie Davis to set up and sing uh, uh, a song and I put the words on the board. And they sung half of the words on the board. Uh, that's creativity. That's, that's genius. The stuff up uh, as they go along and never be the never miss a beat. But that's that's cheap. Now watch this. If you and I do stuff like that, <laughs> if you and I can do stuff like that, if, if a mother can know uh, uh, something is wrong with one of her children, could be way across the country. And they start feeling stuff, sensing stuff, with no verifiable evidence in sight. Well, uh, that's who God is. God's mind is intuitive. Uh, God did not take a class on uh, how to create the universe uh, in seven days. Uh, God didn't take a postgraduate school uh, course on uh, creation universe and uh, how far am I going to put the the sun away from the earth or the moon away from the earth God didn't have a class on that he knew the right distance to keep the earth on its rotational axis around the sun without us burning up that, that, that blows the mind but let me show you what uh, uh, the four stages of God's knowledge. Remember, I said to you, He, he knows the past. Uh, that, that's a beautiful scripture in Isaiah 4 to 16, where it says that God declares the end from the beginning. Wow! Think about that for a second. God starts at the end, works His way back to the beginning. You and I start at the beginning, and we work our way towards the end. Well, now, since God starts at the end, works his way back to the beginning, God is never surprised by anything that happens in his universe. Why? Because he's already, he has already been to the end of his universe. He's already been to the end of time, and he, now he's working his way back through uh, history. That ought to give you great comfort and hope uh, in who God is and how God is controlling things, even when it looks like things are out of control. Let me share a passage with you, Matthew uh, chapter 11, uh, to show you that not only does God know uh, what it was, and God knows what he is, and God knows uh, what it will be, uh, but that God uh, knows one more thing, and that is God knows what uh, could have been. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, beginning uh, at verse number 20, at verse number 20, the Bible said, then began he to upgrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Listen carefully now. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. 
For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, ooh, watch this, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Oh, did you hear what that passage just articulated? God says to the wicked sinners that he's teaching and preaching in his time. He says to them, if Tanya and Zidon would have heard what you have heard, God destroyed those ancient cities in the Old Testament. But God says, to an audience, Jesus says to his audience, if, if they had heard what you have heard, they, listen to this, let me listen to this, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. These ancient wicked cities uh, that were destroyed uh, 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 during the time of Lot. Uh, had had these cities heard Jesus said what you heard they would have repented how in the world does God know what people would have done well he knows because he's God see that see I, I, I'm not bothered when talk about, well, these folk have never heard the gospel. Um, I hear people who are living over in Australia, over in Africa, uh, uh, who are not part of uh, very little of any kind of civilization. Uh, well, what about those who, it's no problem with God. God knows what those people would have done had they been exposed to what you have been exposed to. Here's the danger for you. Uh, you. You've been listening to me preach the gospel on Wednesday night for years. And some of you have yet uh, to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, you've been exposed to the gospel. You, you have no excuse. But neither do those people have an excuse who have never been exposed to the gospel, who have never heard the gospel, because Jesus knows what they would have done had they been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me give you another scenario. In Matthew chapter 17, uh, beginning around uh, verse number 11, we are told a story. Uh, Matthew 17, sorry, verse number 24, we have this account. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Peter said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus stopped him, saying, What well, thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers? Let me explain it, and then let Jesus apply. Now, uh, here at Capernaum, some folk came up to a uh, uh, Peter, while Jesus is inside the house, get the setting and the location. They come up to Peter. Peter's outside the house. Jesus is inside the house. They say to Peter, uh, does your master not pay tribute? Uh, when Jesus, uh, when Peter goes into the house, Jesus stops him and says to him, hey, uh, I heard the conversation out there. Was Jesus eavesdropping? Well, text doesn't tell us. All right? But I want you to know this. He 
said to Peter, let's consider that question to you about whether or not you and I should be paying tribute. Tribute was a temple tax. All right, that is the tax you pay now at the temple. Well, Jesus says to Peter, um, well, Peter, the kings of the earth, who do they receive taxes from? Uh, do they receive taxes from strangers? Or do they receive taxes from their children? Peter said, well, the kings. Uh, well, when it comes to the king and his children, they are exempt. <laughs> uh, they get, the king get their taxes from strangers. In other words, folk who are not members of the family. Then Jesus said, well, the children are free. This is what you need to understand the preaching. Jesus is saying uh, that Peter, uh, uh, my father owns the house. My father owns temple. The temple is my father's house. So why am I expected to pay taxes at a temple my father owns? We, we, in other words, I'm tax exempt. But watch this. I'm not going to find a loophole in the law. I'm not going to take advantage of the fact that my father owns the temple. That's what we're going to do. Peter, go down to the sea. Take a fishing uh, rod. Now, uh, you and I know they had rims and rods in those days, but I'm trying to be contemporary with this. Uh, Peter, take a hook, put it in the water. Um, the first fish that you catch is going to have enough in his mouth to pay my taxes and pay yours. Well, as I uh, sum this up for you real quick, that this is what you need to appreciate. Do you have any idea how many fish are in the sea? In the body of water that, that Peter would, uh, would, would fish in that day? And Jesus said, the first fish you catch is going to have enough money in his mouth to pay my taxes and to pay yours too. Well, wait a minute. Think of the billions of fish in the sea. How did Jesus know that those billion fish that's going to be one money in his mouth. Oh, wow. I guess what I'm trying to say to you is this. God's unknowing. God's omniscient. What I'm going to finalize this for you next week. When I explain to you this, how then can all-knowing God not know something? Join us next Wednesday night and we will finalize and give you the answer to it. And until then, may the Lord of the harvest bless you and may he bless you real good.